you can generate money on the internet off of a website, you're not like your neighbors. Hello, and welcome to the art of selling online courses. We're here to share winning strategies and secret hacks from top performers in the online course industry. My name's John Ainsworth, and today's guest is Dan Andrews. Now, Dan is the founder of the Tropical MBA podcast, the Dynamite Circle Business Network, and Dynamite Jobs. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of community, how community can help you grow your business faster, ways to use your network, how it can help you to stay sane. We're going to talk a lot about the DC, which is the network that Dan founded and I joined back in, I think, 2015, something like that. Now, before we dig into today's interview, I want to remind you of how much your support means to us. We're here to make your podcast experience even better. And you can help us with just a quick favor. If you just take a moment to rate and review our podcast, you're going to give us priceless feedback that helps us shape future episodes. Has the show helped you make money? Has it helped you to grow your business or improve your courses? If it has, share it in the reviews. Go to ratethispodcast.com slash online courses. Nothing would make me happier than to hear how this show has helped you. I have people come up to me at conferences sometimes and they say, oh, I heard your talk or I heard your podcast and I started doing this thing and I make an extra $10,000 a month. And I'm like, if I hadn't bumped into you at the conference, I would never have known that. So take this opportunity. And if you have implemented some of these tactics, let us know about it. We've done over 100 episodes of the show today. I'm dying to know which one was your favorite, which guest you enjoyed the most, who you'd love to hear as the next guest on the show. So let us know in a review. Go to ratethispodcast.com slash online courses and let us know. Dan, welcome to the show, man. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. If I look distracted, it's because I'm at Rate My Podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's great. That's that's so cool. So um, I'm just, I was just trying to figure out like the fastest way to rate the podcast. And uh -huh. for me, I think it's going into my podcast app and clicking five stars. Yeah. But then, so I guess RateMyPodcast.com is kind of like a link tree. Is that yes. what it's like? And yeah, so then you yeah. get specific instructions on Apple, iTunes, Pod. That's really cool. I yeah, love yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my and so it's easier than remembering, day. like going to a web, some random place on your domain. Yeah, you just get your instructions there. I love that. Very cool. I will rate it. Start off with kind of the broad topic, and then I want to dive into some of the history of the DC. Can you talk us through why do you think community is so important? I'm trying to figure out where to even begin. I'm thinking about this topic that we've been talking about the last few weeks about shiny object syndrome. Mm -hmm. Barracuda. The, <laughs> the concept of <laughs> my co-host deemed people who love opportunities barracudas. They see shiny things in the ocean and they want to swim after it. And I think so many of us start businesses because we see opportunities everywhere. And we mm -hmm. see what other people are doing and we say, wow, that person is growing money on trees. I read about it on Facebook. They must be. I saw their YouTube channel. <laughs> now I'm going to go do that. And then you start doing it and you realize maybe it's not working out as well for you as it was for them. And part of the value of community is if you have some equity with that person, you can just call them. Mm. You can just see them in person. You can jump on a call or you can fly to their city or you can go to an event where they're going to be. And you can corner them and say, hey, I saw your YouTube video. What's the real thing behind that? And invariably, they will share it with you. Mm. You know, eight times out of 10, and depending on the community context, they will actually just tell you the information that you're seeking. And they're building equity with you in return. They're saying, all right, I see you. You got a good vibe. I'm going to share this piece of information with you. And then you start to build trust. And for me, um, the internet can be an inefficient way to exchange knowledge. Mm. And community sh provides a shortcut to that and helps you see at the front lines of the people who are making moves, seeing what they're doing. That's one of my favorite parts of community. A lot of other benefits too, but that was the one I was thinking about this week. What got you to start it? I told you once, I think we saw each other at like uh, DCBKK. And just for context for everybody, DCBKK is one of uh, the DC's like flagship, big events. It's probably the biggest one. It's out in Bangkok once a year in October. Mm-hmm. And we were hanging out in um, the exec lounge and I told you that I'd been listening to your podcast from the beginning again. And <laughs> you were like, man, I'm horrible. sorry to hear that. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bad life decision, man. <laughs> and it was so fascinating to me. Like the, the, the hearing you kind of going through some of the steps that obviously happened before starting the DC. So it was 
you were talking to, you were getting people who were listening to podcasts, emailing you, and then you were having calls with them and you were like chatting away with them. Back then, why was that such a big deal? So here's my kind of thinking on this, right? So for the per, the person listening, this is what I want to kind of hopefully get across. If you're not in some great business network where you connect with loads of other people, I want to try and get across some of what you can get out of that, whether you join the DC or some other group. It's like, I get, I have no shares in this, by the way. I just love the DC. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I get no benefit from this. But like, I want people to try and understand why they should be doing this and why this is going to help them with running their running their business. So for you back then, why was that such a big deal? I had some early experiences of bumping into people who ran businesses that were like ours at the time, and they were they still are so unique. If you can generate money on the internet um, off of a website, you're not like your neighbors typically mm. and bumping into other people who do that and you know are taking on the challenge for me in the entrepreneurial space the incredible dignity and anxiety and challenge of hey i'm not just showing up and someone's paying me like i gotta figure that out every single day mm. and for me that felt like the most exciting thing in the world but also terrifying and so when I would bump into the rare individual who was doing the same, it felt like a treasure chest was unlocked. Mm. And it became instantly obvious to me that that's what we needed. We needed to get more people in the room. And it was a terribly difficult thing to do. When I lived in San Diego, I would go to business meetups all the time. And this could be in any niche. It could be if you're searching for a new church or a new pickup basketball game, you know, uh, like you want to play with players that have the right think of the game the same way you do and maybe a little bit better than you and some people you can teach. And and I found the same sort of principle applied in the business world is that you wanted to be around people that you could kind of support each other because what you're doing is difficult. And that's what it felt like for me. It's like there was so many difficulties and so much excitement that I wanted to share it with other people. Both the angst, the fear and the the excitement of what we were embarking on. I think so for me, so I started my first business in something like 2008, something like that. And I was just anybody else I knew who ran a business. I was like, Oh my God, we must talk. And I would talk, try and talk to them about <laughs> business. And most of them did not want to talk about business. They just liked doing their thing. You know, so I had a friend who was a builder and, you know, hired four people, four guys who came and did all the work. Have you? And I had a friend who was a hairdresser and I would just talk to her about the, the, how she ran the hairdressing, you know, the, the, yes. the salon. Right. And they were like, they clearly weren't that fussed about it they weren't trying to really grow the business they just liked she, she just loved running a really lovely hair salon that was it yeah you know she liked cutting hair and she was like i guess i have to manage some other hairdressers because you can't just have a salon for one person kind of thing and you know she just like liked the way it looked and nice plants and nice music and whatever it's just like she didn't want to talk about that and i remember desperately trying to find something some other you know some way of connecting with my people and I, I probably wasn't wording it quite like that. And I tried out a whole bunch of different Facebook groups. And I think I tried some stuff in person in London. And it was just like, oh, this isn't it. And then one day, and I've, I think I've told you this before. One day I Googled, um, is the four-hour work week a scam? Or something like that, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's just too hard. Not as easy as Tim Ferriss said it was going to be. And... Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I found an episode of your podcast, The Tropical MBA, and it was one where it was either the one where you got uh, Justin from Empire Flippers and maybe Joe from there as well. I forget who you guys had on. And you kind of went through it chapter by chapter. It was either that one or it was the Dreamline one that you guys did. Okay. And um, I listened to it and I thought, I don't like these guys. <laughs> and... <laughs> And about, I just like deleted that. That was gone. <laughs> I was I was not in a great mood. And about a year or two later, I, I searched for the same thing again. And I found it again. And I was like, yes, somehow I changed. I don't know what I'd gone through in between. But like, I was like, yes, these are my people. And I was like, I have to join this. I was so excited about it. So that was 2015 when I joined. And it was just like, oh, my God, there's other people out there who are doing the same kind of thing as what I'm doing. And this is like, this is invaluable. This is so good. Um, I need to I need to be spending time hanging out with them, you know, and that was, uh, there wasn't a big group in London at the time, but I went out to DCBCN 
the event out in Barcelona and was just like, oh my God, this is phenomenal. Like, this is so good. Uh, and then, so that's why I kind of started setting up the whole London chapter. So shout out, if anybody listening is in London and running their course business, uh, message me. I'm john at datadrivenmarketing.co and uh, maybe you can come along and hang out with us in the London group. Yeah, and you guys, you've built the most vibrant group, sub, like the most vibrant chapter in the DC. So if you want to meet, like have that experience, London's the, the most happening city in the world right now for that. Yeah. So you're, you're in a, a great position to meet uh, handfuls and handfuls of incredible founders hanging out in London. It's, it's actually quite remarkable. I don't think London would be the first peep thing on, um, you know, like in America, for example, a lot of bootstrap founders move away from New York City mm. because it's so expensive to live there. They'll just go down the train line somewhere to a little bit more affordable. Why do you think London has retained so many of the founders in the UK? Well, I think, I think a bunch of people did move away or would have moved away, but like now as people are making bank, you know, these are people yeah. who are running seven figure businesses and have sold seven figure businesses and are, are doing just fine. And they're like, yeah, London's baller, man. Yeah. If you've got, if you've got some it money, is London is a place to be. <laughs> there is cool shit going on here every day of the week. Totally. Uh, and so I think that's, that's a part of it, you know, like eight, nine years ago, this probably wouldn't have been the, the same thing, right? Because our whole community, people in this group generally weren't making so much money back yeah. then. I think part of it, you know, when I was thinking about, I was in a very similar position where there was people with more traditional small businesses that I was trying to kind of nerd out with and they weren't nerding, mm -hmm. to, yeah. you know, they were making a living. And part of what the web did in those early days, maybe looking back, I can see this a little bit now is like, you know, being an entrepreneur, I don't know would have been available to me like pre-internet. Mm. You know, I don't know like what that hustle would have looked like if I ever could have gotten there because I'm not incredibly talented or incredibly motivated to the degree that business titans are mm -hmm. on the one hand, you know, and also wasn't particularly well positioned. I probably would have just had to go make a living. But because the web came along, it democratized entrepreneurship there was like a shift where now okay it's not available to everybody but there's a percentage of populations in these sorts of countries with these sorts of backgrounds that now you can do this you can focus on value generation and building organizations and stuff like that and you can do it when you're in your 20s mm. and that to me was the opportunity that we saw and sort of took it up and then looked around and it's like it was not super common you know and so i think seeking out the people that took up that torch and like you said now um it's been fascinating because at the time it was like okay well you don't want to nerd out you don't want to nerd out i guess i gotta call some people on the internet you know all around the country and world who want to nerd out about the stuff and still can only find 10 or 12 of us that i can find and then fast forward 15 years and it's like we're balling out we're living in london mm. and maybe Maybe somebody that's a generation older than me would say, well, that's how it was in our generation too. You know, there's, there's always those folks who kind of get to the edge of possibility and say, well, I'm not going to get a, the, the good, good school, good job thing seems to be breaking down to a degree. What if, you know, I looked into some Google real estate in terms of search rankings or looked into building a YouTube channel or looked into mm. some of these new things that, you know, I remember it only like a few years ago, very respectable business people making fun of YouTube, you know, like, mm. oh, you're going to like make YouTube videos. Like I thought, you know, <laughs> you're going to be a serious person or something. And yeah. there is a little bit of that. Whereas like the, I'm imagining most people that listen to this show are like, YouTube's a great opportunity. Well, that's still kind of a rare opinion as of just a few years ago. Mm. And so anyway, I just think that it's, it's fascinating that a lot of us who gravitate to entrepreneurship also, we gravitate to opinions that might not be shared by the mainstream, and it makes finding a community that normalizes and perpetuates that what line of thinking like an even greater superpower. I was chatting with someone the other day. I think it was Christopher Sutton. You know Christopher, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was saying how he'd heard somebody, I don't know, on you know Instagram or whatever, saying, you think starting a business is hard? Well, what's harder, starting a business or doing something you hate for the rest of your life. And he said, <laughs> Christopher said to me, 
I thought about that, and the answer is starting a business. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like it's like this is however unpleasant that might be this yeah. is still harder oh, this yeah. is still harder to do which is i think one of the reasons why it's like it's so important to be around other people i must do i hard absolutely thing. must steal that from Chris. <laughs> that is so fantastic i've been thinking about that because we are 15 years in now i am in mm. my career yeah and um you know i'm interviewing uh, for a new position for a podcast producer right now, in fact. Mm. And it's interesting to see people in the mid and late parts of their careers and you see what they've accomplished. They're writing on their resumes, on their applications, and that's what they've accomplished. You know, like there's no argument for, well, I'm going to do more next time or whatever. It's like you had 20 years mm -hmm. and that's what you got done. And I'm starting to see that in my entrepreneurial career too and see the difficulty in essentially producing your own retirement, which... Mm. That's an enormous challenge. Like, how are you going to retire? How are you going to make money, you know, indefinitely until you and your family ages out? And it's such a big challenge that I do think it's easier to outsource it to, especially a world-class company. If you can get a job at, you know, a premier brand, right? Maybe they have a better uh, grip on how to retire you in terms of financially than you do yourself. And, and that's an enormous challenge that I didn't quite see when I was 25 mm. and thinking, wow, the internet, you can shake it and money comes out of it, you know? So I do think um, that is a, a genuine challenge that the sort of excitement of new businesses and shiny objects um, don't necessarily contend with. So yeah, it's, it's hard. One of the things that I've, I've had a lot of conversations about this recently, and you're just gonna have to trust me, this is gonna connect back in a sec. Um, is around how many people that run businesses online are neurodivergent in some way. This is the new trendy term that's going around, you know, ADHD, autistic, something kind of along those kind of lines yeah. in some way. And I was chatting with our friend Itamar about this, and he said, because he's um, uh, diagnosed ADHD, and which I never would have guessed, but he said, for some people, for starting a business, no, he said starting a business is incredibly hard. Running a business is incredibly hard. But if your brain works that way, then having a job might be even harder. And so you kind of have to get through it with running a business because you're like, I just couldn't face going back to having a job. And I was like, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting one, almost like a, you're not doing this as much out of motivation out of, as much as are the other things even harder, the other things even less pleasant. Sorry, even less unpleasant. I don't know. I've got the wrong. It makes total sense to I mean, me what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us end up starting businesses because we can't hold it down a job. It's not yeah. always um, or the pain of the job is so extreme. For example, um, you know, just that you feel controlled by a boss. Mm. And there's negative emotions that come from the sensation of somebody controlling you. And so eventually you're like, go pound sand, get out of here. Now I'm going to go start a business. And then when the business gets some traction and you have team members showing up that now have their own ideas and, and they want things from you and they're bringing you problems and stuff, you start to feel controlled again. And now you're back to where you started. <laughs> oh, that's not where I thought you were going with that at all. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and, and the challenge is if, because a lot of, the, a lot, one of the things I love to think about is how the best things about a place are often the worst things about a place and the same with individuals mm. and the same with our personalities. So if you're a rebel, you know, and you don't like to take instructions from anybody, that can be the best thing about you, but it also can be your yeah. Achilles heel. And so a lot of what inspires people to jump into entrepreneurship, like risk taking, for example, is a classic example. You're a risk taker. But then as your business gets bigger, you keep taking risks and it uh, implodes. So one of the challenges I see for a lot of folks in our community, neurodivergent, um, a lot of extreme personalities too, people just with interesting backgrounds, weird backgrounds, just like like to take adventures, whatever, a lot of different um weirdos i think like the people that are want to do things that are interesting and unique mm. protecting that downside as you scale i think is an interesting psychological challenge that the thing that makes you special 
the fact that you have a new idea every week, back to shiny object syndrome, could be an enormous Achilles heel when you're managing a team of 15, 20, 25, and you show up to the meeting every week and you have a new idea about how the business should run. <laughs> trust me, I've tried it. Um, it doesn't make for a happy team. They don't think it's cool, you know? Like, But if you go to your entrepreneurial hangout in London and hang out with John, check out this new idea. We're gonna have a blast, you know? But the team <laughs> hates it. So the, another uh, value of community is, um, you know, we were working on an event today and I was like, <clears throat> the part of the advantage of going to this community event versus like a team retreat is that you get to like shed your normal team and take on a temporary board, you know, and you get to try on some fresh things that in the team environment, you have to be more responsible, I think typically. Mm. So anyway, another thing with the community <laughs> is it can be that kind of those board members, if you're trusting and you bring people in to take a look and to give you a gut check on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things going back to what you just said about <clears throat> about having these new ideas and always turning up and the team getting sick of it. I realized that I did that and um I was that, you know, barracuda heading off after the shiny new thing. And so I banned <laughs> myself from ever doing any of those things. I was like, no, you're just not allowed to. So I decided I was going to do the whole business through my team. I was like, I'm just going to work through my team and I'm going to coach them and I'm going to support them to do everything. And it worked to an extent in terms of the whole business runs pretty much without me, right? But the, the flip side, the thing I lost there was I'm really, really good at turning up and looking at something one specific thing one you know whether it's the whole business or a specific part of it and being like no nah, we could do this better and then being willing to throw everything out try a new thing throw everything out try a new thing just again and again and again until i'm like that's it that's working and no one is willing to do that like employee wise that i've found right that's just that's not normal and i don't know if it's because well they wouldn't be willing to because it's not their business and like they don't have the right to do that. But I think it's more a personality thing. Like I think just very few people think in that way, act in that way. And because I decided, I knew that I did that and it was the downside, I stopped myself from doing it. But actually it's useful sometimes. And so what I started doing is I said to my team, right, what thing is there? What's the bottleneck? What's the thing? What's the, what's the point in the current business? Not my crazy new idea but like a specific thing that needs to work better. Or I'd go look in the business and I'd find something. I'd be like, all right, cool. That's what I'm going to work on. I'm going to try again and again and again and again until I find what that thing is. Um, the, 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 what, the, what the perfect, the amazing version of that thing is. And then at that point, I'd be like, cool, now let me go work on the next thing. I think what you're talking about is like a such fertile topsoil for founders. Like I could just hang out there and grow a garden for years in terms of what's available in the literature. There's so many ways to think about that challenge because it's your good taste and your intensity that typically mm. gets us into the, like if you're a course creator, it's like, Hey, I've looked at all the materials and it didn't work for me. And like, I know what's wrong with these other courses and I'm going to create the one, you know, mm. and it's that taste and intensity that drives us to start businesses. Mike Michelitz talked about this recently. He talks about it in his book called Clockwork, mm -hmm. which is a book about bridging that zone to like, I'm making a living with my business to it's on the trajectory for wealth and it's being run by a team. And he talks about walking away from the business to basically find what the kind of homeostasis is of the team in terms of like quality and execution without some founder kind of like banging on about this and that. And I find myself doing that all the time, right? You get angry. I do. I get angry. I get frustrated and I show up and I vent to the team about why didn't you notice that you didn't meet this standard that I have right now <laughs> in my head. <laughs> yeah. yes. And Mike's like, great. That's what got you to start a business. Cool. Yeah. But that's not your business. Like that's you running around being a maniac in the world. Mm. And so I thought that that's really interesting. And I'm kind of combining that with thoughts that so many business coaches have shared with me, which is at the sort of seven figure mark, you have to move from player to coach. Mm -hmm. And 
how do you coach an organization to be excellent? And how do you define excellence in a way that other people understand so that they can systematically meet that standard that you believe? I think in, in my heart, I believe like, because we cared about this stuff is why we exist. Like mm. you need to care now too, or else it's all going to go away, you know? And that's a very challenging thing. I don't have any easy answers for that, but I do think hanging out there for a while is really productive territory. Well, tying that whole thing back into the community angle, I think that one of the things, one of the advantages I've got versus someone in my team who is, let's say, you know, I've got team members who are way smarter than me, who are way more talented than me at what they're doing, but they aren't hanging out with all these other business owners and seeing, oh, that's what great looks like. Or that's what doing that thing really, really well looks like. You know, like I've got friends who are YouTubers and I'm like, oh, okay, let me go talk to them about what running a really good YouTube channel looks like. Now let me aim towards that. Okay, I've got, I know people who are doing direct outreach, uh, cold outreach to try and bring clients in. Okay, what is, what is the best of all of that look like? Okay, now we've got something to kind of aim towards. So even though I don't know how to do that thing to an excellent standard, I've got more of an idea of what excellent looks like because of being surrounded by all these people just getting, you know, um, kind of picking some of it up by osmosis from people in terms of like, this is what, this is how well you could do this thing. And yeah. we currently suck here. I can see that we suck that hurts and it's unpleasant yeah. and I'm not blaming you guys. You haven't done, you're not done a bad job or anything like that. You've done the best that you could with my, with my poor quality coaching. Cause I suck at this thing as well, but I know that we could do this thing about five times better mm -hmm. now. Let's, so it's worth us going after it. Now let's do that. You know? And I think that's a, a thing that community is phenomenal for that. I don't even know how you would like, I, I don't know how you would package that in some other way. Well, I think it's a fascinating topic because it's, it's an enormous challenge and every founder is going to face it as essentially you're scaling and you can't afford world-class people to do the thing that you want to be world-class mm -hmm. or like niche class or, you know, delivered in the way that you want it to be delivered. A lot of popular thinking around this topic is about sort of reducing your surface areas, simplifying your execution, really focusing on what battles you want to win when you're undercapitalized. And your job as the founder is then to capitalize the, the company well so that you can essentially afford professionals mm. that are in communities of professionals. So ideally, you know, I'm hiring a podcast producer right now. I would hire somebody from Gimlet mm -hmm. or from The Ringer and they are in a community of podcasters. They do fly to podcasting and I'm purchasing that expertise into my company. However, to do it, I need to be well capitalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that's the challenge for founders is most of us can't fight that battle at that level across all functional areas of our company. And so we're cutting corners and that's our job is to, you know, get, get the most out of very little. Um, but often I think we just take on too much mm. and realize like that one of the things I do constantly in business that's not served me well is just think that we can do so much mm. and not really i'm always amazed when i say like well how much would this cost for like a quote real company to do like if you actually <laughs> bought yeah. these things on the market and then how would i make margin on that and often as founders we're so dynamic and like love the space and can find shortcuts all the time that we're not actually we're like basically covering costs with our effort engine effort and ingenuity mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. that window won't last that long. And so I think it's an interesting exercise to kind of like back out and say, well, if you're going to cut corners, can, do you see a world in which this is capitalized well enough that you can bring in those experts Yeah. or like, it does it always depend on some like arbitrage band aid play that won't hold up over time. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things, right, that's I think just so hard about starting a business. So you've got a skill, right? Let's say you're good at something. You can get people to pay you to do that thing. That's cool. So then you want to turn that into a business. This is, and that's how a lot of people start what they're doing, right? Is yeah. Have a skill and then expand out from there. Um, certainly, that's kind of the agency model. To a certain extent, it's the product model as well. Maybe the sure. SaaS thing as well. So you then hire a team, but you can't afford to hire a team who's any good because right. 
you're not making enough money and you somehow so you have to get good enough great all people horrible the at their jobs yeah <laughs> <Everybody>. <laughs> <laughs> so like then you have to just brute force that enough for however many years until you get to the point where you're making enough money that you can then go okay we're gonna up level a little bit and up level a little bit I mean, some people go right we're gonna we're just gonna put loads of money into this one role that's your crucial the crucial thing like I, mike mccallowick says queen bee role i guess that kind of thing right yeah and just be like we're gonna get that leveled up and then i'm just gonna brute force all the other ones and see can i can i manage to somehow you know get this to the point where the whole thing does run and i can hire professionals who can come in and do this to the right standard but it's like that's such a that bridging that gap is so difficult it's so difficult by the numbers like if you just look at the numbers like two to three percent of businesses do it or whatever i don't know the actual it's less than ten percent of businesses mm. get to a I call it the adults phase when you yeah. can like hire prof industry professionals at market rates to perform the work and it's still, the business still is profitable. Yeah. And I think the reason for that, John, if I had to guess and having observed a lot of businesses is that most businesses just don't have like the fundamental business model. Mm-hmm and power in the marketplace to actually do that. And so they depend on the founder doing all the things you're describing. Mm. And that's what a lot of people would deride as like a job at scale, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is fine, right? Because you're, you're in a position to solve that problem. You know what I mean? If you know about it and if you continue to work at it. So, um, but it is, a, I think the reason we're kind of hanging out here is I found it to be like where so many of us get stuck, myself included, and it's really challenging. It's really challenging to get out of that space where you have a job at scale and you're cutting a lot of corners. You have a profitable thing going on, but it might not last for five or 10 years. And figuring out how to get through that event horizon, the rewards are so enormous. Um, the two rewards that I see that are enormous are number one, bringing in the adults like we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. And then number two, exiting for what would be generational wealth and or like a number that would shelve financial questions for a lifetime. If you can be one of the few businesses that gets through that level and pushes to say somewhere around $10, $10 million a year with a profitable, sustainable model, I mean, you don't your financial questions can be shelved at that level. And I think the payoff is so huge, it's worth attempting to get there. Hmm. You can also do the opposite and polarize the opposite direction and optimize for cash flow. And then if you're not spending all your money on horrible employees who aren't, you know, solving the business model question, you can get really lean, drop cash to your personal bottom line, and then put cash in the hands of professional managers. Mm. You know, why, why put cash in the hands of some affordable person on the, you know, some side part of your business that they want a career? Why not put it into you know, a professional company in the stock market, for example, where they can build your cash for you and you can focus on your lifestyle and doing great for your clients in a really simple focused way. So you don't want to get stuck in the middle. I think if you're going to like traverse into that middle space, where you are starting to grow a team and things are getting expensive. I think it's incumbent on us as founders. And I'm talking kind of like, you know, between like 700 and 2 million in revenue. Like this is mm. sort of the death zone. Um, <laughs> and you, <laughs> It's the death zone. And the reason is is because you take your salary out yeah. and then you start to like, you have all these like complicated business operations that demand people to run them and there's not much money left over at the end mm. of the day. And how are you going to scale to where you can get professionals who can perpetuate the business to, so you can become a coach or, you know, someone else can drive the business. That is, you know, you can't afford to both pay yourself and that person. That's why that's the death zone. Mm. And so... Um, and this is like, is one of these kind of like mimetic things that just keeps coming up in the literature. Like everybody finds it. Like this is where good businesses go to die. So the good news is, is if you know about the death zone, you can still have a $1.5 million business. That's incredibly lean. We know friends mm -hmm. who have them and your profit margins are excellent and you're not spending money on headcount as a means to push through without clear answers. Mm. So in fact, I'm speaking with a guy. There's a great book about this topic called, I'll hold it up since we're on YouTube. This book right here. It's a, it's a fantastic, a fantastic book. It's called Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. And it, it, what it does is 
all the things theoretically that we've been talking about, it puts numbers to these concepts and, and forces you to contend with the real numbers we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're curious about the things we're, sh we're sharing, this is a cool kind of case to like make sure as you press through the death zone to maintain profitability and it makes a strong case why that's important. Yeah, I've taken on recently the uh, profit first advice after having heard it and not listened to it for a long time. I was like, all right, okay. So I messaged my accountant maybe in November and I said, what I want you to do from January is take 5% of the revenue. And so what is profit first, John? Profit first is a very straightforward concept, which is that instead of it being revenue minus expenses equals profits, it's revenue minus profits equals expenses. And you take out of the business the profits from the beginning, some percentage. And he said he suggests starting with 1%. Maybe it then goes up to 5 or 10 or 20, whatever the number is. And then whatever's left, that's the money you've got left to figure out how do you make the business run afterwards. Yeah. Because otherwise, what ends up happening is you run the business and you don't really get paid for it because you can always find something else to spend the money on. Yeah. So you take the profits out and you put that aside. And so I decided I'm going to listen to that and I'm going to give that a try and see, okay, well then let's figure out how do we, what do we do with the rest of the money? So I've only done 5% for now and I haven't actually taken the profits out yet, but I'm fucking excited about it. <laughs> I'm like, I once, I used to give my team bonuses based on um, certain points that they would hit. And I realized after a while I was giving them bonuses and I wasn't getting paid a bonus myself. And so I paid myself a bonus. It wasn't very, you know, not huge amounts of money. And with it, I bought a Bluetooth speaker and a, <laughs> amongst some other things, right? It was a hundred pounds. It's Splashed like an out. insignificant <laughs> amount of money, right? <laughs> and I love that Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> I love it more because I got, I paid for that with my bonus. I got that as extra. That wasn't my wages for doing the job. That's a bonus. And I'm like, oh, I feel like I might feel the same way about the profits. It's like, right, this is extra money I got for owning the business, you know, which I've never had. I've got paid the salary. I've never got paid anything else for owning the business. So um, I'm kind of on board with that concept and I'm going to try that one out. Well, Greg, basically, if you love Profit First, Greg Crabtree's book, he pushes deeper into that and talks about mm -hmm. why it's so important for you to both take a salary that's market rate and consider profits beyond that. And he makes a beautiful case for why that's critical for getting through the zone of death. And he was attached to EO, a community for a long time. Um, and also Vern Harnish's scaling up community. So he has like the reps of seeing all these companies, you know, from an anecdotal perspective, because we know like there's not a lot of scientists studying this stuff. He's seen this zone of death and he's saying like the problem is, and this is comes back to profit first, is that basically you're a bad capital allocator. Like that's, that's the punchline. Probably the things you're spending money on in your company. Mm-hmm aren't growing the business and you need mm. to contend with that. That raise you gave that person, you're not going to get more value out of it. So, so you have to contend with it. Like, I know you want to give the person a raise, but also you have to contend with the brute financial fact that you've wasted money. Mm. And, and that's tough when, when business feels like 25 elemental decisions on a weekly basis, like, well, we need to go to this conference and we need to uh, give this person a raise and we need to pay that vendor and we need to do this. And then at the end of the day, it turns out your business isn't fe financially feasible. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not, it's not a good business. And what are you doing? And uh, I think for so many of us and what resonates about the, the profit first book for so many of us, we just think, well, I'm going to get that next deal. You know, there's always like that next yeah. thing. I, now yeah. my table set, how many times, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard people, myself included say, well, with the team that we've got, we can handle this much more revenue, right? Like yeah. we're all like the table is set for the turkey to show up. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to feast. We're going to feast. So, <laughs> but the reality is, is like we were in that position six months before, but we're spend up. We spend up. We spend up. And so, yeah. I think, of course, you have to spend to grow. The question is, how do you do it effectively? And it's a hard question to answer. Mm. I want to get your input on there's a community that I've started, which is I've got a WhatsApp group for course creators. And I set this up because what I found was there's no 
if you're an e-commerce, if you run an e-commerce business, there are conferences, there are communities, there are paid communities, there's Facebook groups. If you run a SaaS business, there's the same. If you run product businesses, I'm guessing there probably are as well. And for course businesses, this just doesn't seem to exist. I just, I've searched and I've searched and I've not found it. There's stuff mm. if you want to start something, then there's a guru who will teach you how to start a course business. But if you run a successful course business, it doesn't exist. And I was like, oh, this is so frustrating because I can't go to this place to go and meet all these you know, successful course creators. And I was like, no, this is a fantastic opportunity. I'm going to take this. I'm going to start <laughs> this myself. So I started, and of course I did it as a, as a WhatsApp group because I, I heard you were on the podcast talking about how obsessed I we are with WhatsApp groups. I love WhatsApp groups. <laughs> I love WhatsApp. <laughs> Fucking love it. So for anybody listening, if you are doing over 20,000 a month with your course business and you want to join the, the WhatsApp group, it's free. It's got like 40 people in there. Then message me, john at datadrivenmarketing.co. But like, how did you, how did you get, when you were getting the DC started and you were like trying to get that kind of critical mass of people in there and you're like trying to attract more people in, what, how did that happen? Is it just the podcast? Like, what is it that, well, that did question, that for you? Real quick question. I'm going to answer that question, but why doesn't it exist? What's your hypothesis? I think that, no, I don't know. I haven't figured that out. Could, Why doesn't it exist? Because there's a lot of course creators. Is it, <clears throat> is it that they're not as interested in like general entrepreneurship as like other, like do course creators typically stick to their expertise or do they are generally interested in courses? Could it be that? Or is it that, is there a vulnerability to course creators being around other course creators? Like, could they steal their ideas or something like that? Or is there I any kind of know. reason There's that's one, There was one group that I know of, right, that that, that does exist, which is run by uh, DC or Ollie Richards. Mm -hmm. And it's for language course creators. And they all have a great time. They get together. There's like 20 or 30 people in this group. And they get together and they discuss their businesses. And so they're sharing ideas with each other, even though they're all in language, the language course space. Okay. So, and the people who are our clients don't seem to have a problem with sharing stuff with each other. I haven't come across that. My so, guess is that it would no. be a net benefit for them to be around each other because with a course business, the constraint seems to be distribution, not the course itself. Yeah. So if you knew a bunch of other course creators, you could get e efficiency in terms of your operation because you could even share operational partners. You could like swap notes about how to make your course delivery more efficient. And so you win there. And then swap notes and do collabs on distribution deals. Um, so to me, it seems like course creators would benefit a ton from hanging out with each other. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like a no-brainer from that respect. Um, how is the WhatsApp group doing? It's great. I mean, everyone's very active. Everyone is uh, asking and answering questions for each other. Uh, we do workshops. I get people in the group to come and do workshops for each other. I bring in external experts. Like we had Adrian Savage, who's probably the maybe like, you know, top in the world at email deliverability at the moment. He's certainly the top oh, one wow. I've ever heard of. And we got him to come and do a workshop for the group about, you know, there's the new updates to Google and Yahoo email deliverability. So he came and talked about that. And um Yeah, so it's it's great, but I, I feel like I in an ideal world it's like two, three hundred people, you know, or maybe even more, something like that. I don't know about as a WhatsApp group still, but like maybe. And yeah, because you need yeah. you need more people. Yeah, well, the two options are, I think, to add people for free, mm -hmm. and have some. Kind oh yeah, of it's totally free. Yeah. Oh, it's free now. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, then, yeah, getting the right people in there that's good. So you have like low friction but high standards. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. That would be good, and then you have to have an event. Gotta have an event. Okay. You gotta have an event. I think that's the only answer, or that's Why? the. I think that's the obvious answer. Well, because it just shortcuts so many of the complicated things you'd have to do virtually otherwise. Okay. You know, it's like, it seems like a lot of work and you know how much work it is on the surface. But if you think about how much happens at the event and then you would like figure out how much it would take to do all that virtually, the event starts looking like less work. Hmm. For you attracting can just, people in? No, 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 for I think creating the gel okay, yeah, and the yeah, magnetism yeah. of the, the community and helping your current members to really get a lot of value out of it. I think that's, it's like a value delivery mechanism. Mm. So 
Um, I think that's one of the challenges with communities is keeping people in them, you mm -hmm. know, because the switching costs are really low. And so having people come to events gels them together. So I think that that, like, seeding the group up to that critical mass, is there a campaign you can run or some kind of, perhaps you could do, like, some kind of giveaway uh, in, in terms of, like, what you're doing with email deliverability, like, that's, like, a really cool thing. Maybe you could create some kind of ruckus around that that would, where, like, this is what you're doing and, like, there's a limit to it and you can get mm -hmm. in now if you take these following actions. So you yeah. get to your first, like, 150 people and then those can sort of be that Dunbar number that if they're gelling, then that could be the base for a productive community. Nice. All right. Yeah, I've got plans for running an event. We run the one in London. We're gonna. I'm gonna run one for this group. As soon as we get to I think a hundred people in the group, something like that. I'm thinking that kind of might start to be enough people to to put an event on and, and uh, maybe 25 people or something first time. We'll see. Yeah, and you know the events like it, you could always just do it with 15 people as well and have it be a mm -hmm. day thing and like have it be really light and for people that are just in Europe or just in America, depending on where you're at and keep it a one day thing. And then that could then be like some gravitas that you could use within the group. Hey, 15 of us got together. I think it's hard for that to go wrong really. And it would give a good sense for you, like who the people are and yeah. I don't know. That's, I think that's how I'd approach it. I love the idea of having an event. So I'll take it that way. More events. <laughs> so I got one more question for you and then I want to just uh, talk about where people can go if they've heard enough about the DC they're like holy shit I need to be part of this <laughs> everybody when they tell them oh yeah I'm part of this group called the DC they will say oh, what does that stand for and I say it's for the dynamite circle and they go oh hmm. why is it called that and I've heard a story like third hand from somebody but could you tell us why is it called the dynamite circle well you know I, I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure out right now whether I should like create a fantasy about it. <laughs> <laughs> the answer the answer isn't great. I mean, because it, it's it's not a great name. <laughs> uh, I would go back to myself at that time and be like, you should think this through. Because the good part is that people say the DC and they say DCers. Yeah. And so if you're going to start a community, one of the things you want to think about is there's like, um, what do they call it? Uh, not instructive, but like there's like a value that's useful to people in a community. Mm -hmm. But then there's also an identity piece. Like, well, what does it mean that I'm in John's course creator group? And I think that's something that's worth reflecting on. Like, okay, well, we're all going to kick ass and like learn better course techniques, but also we're teaching the world or mm -hmm. Like we're passionate about our knowledge set or something. There's something that it, like it means something to be here too. And um, thinking about that in your brand and name, I think is a is a good idea. So I'm really glad that like DC and like the DC years has come about organically. But Dynamite Circle is um, like a very quick name that was come up within a moment that we needed a name to put us all into a forum. Mm -hmm. And I had a, this is the real story, so it's not exciting. At the time, I owned a company called Dynamite Publishing, which owned the blog and podcast. And at our first meetup, we all sat in a circle. That's it. <laughs> it's, a shit, it's a shit story. <laughs> I knew that was, uh, I knew it wasn't an exciting story. <laughs> I really wanted to embarrass you by just getting uh, you to tell it's it. Horrible. So it's I horrible. Appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you going with me. But I'll tell you I, what, the good part of the story was it, we just didn't think the name mattered at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a big part of it. And I do remember sitting in this group and it's kind of back to the top of our call, which was we were all like completely gushing. Like we couldn't believe I believe there was like 19 of us. Sometimes like 20 mm -hmm. of us, basically. Like we talked about the event that you could host. There's, you're looking at like 19 other people who had quit their jobs, who made money on the internet, and who just had this way about them that they were going to do it themselves and that they were going to share with you and that we were going to do it together. And we just, we left the event and we were like, when's the next one? You know? Mm. And so we didn't even have time to rename the thing. 
we were busy on to figure out where we're going to meet up again. So that's, that's the origin of the dynamite circle. So. And if someone's interested and wants to find out more about it, dynamitecircle.com. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have more course creators in the group. It's fantastic. Uh, if you want to hear Dan, uh, expound on his philosophies about business, uh, then in the long form. MBA podcast. Yep. Uh, if you want to hear more fantastic. exciting stories. <laughs> <laughs> want to hear him talk about barracudas. And... I'm on episode um, like 800, John. I just coming up with anything at this point. I'm about <laughs> <laughs> We've got to have something, man. I was chatting with Mark Webster, who runs the Authority Hacker podcast about it. He's like, look, I talk about SEO. What do you do in SEO? You write good content <laughs> and you build links. That's it. I got to talk about that somehow every week. I've got to find another angle. It's like, that's it. There is nothing else that you do. It's ah, the game. <laughs> thanks so much for coming on today, man. I had a blast. This was really awesome. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come and uh, uh, talk shit with me about everybody. Thanks, John. I appreciate it.